I think the question is kind of obvious to some degree. You go to most short tracks anywhere in the United States or Canada, and you surveyed most of the cars in the pits. What viscosity were they running? I'd be hard pressed to find any area where this isn't the predominant choice. Do we all agree with that statement? Yep. Yeah, it's just right or wrong, this <clears throat> is the dominant choice. The question is why? Right? Um, good example is okay, while these two may not seem like there's anything in common, they're both about 800 plus horsepower, all aluminum block engines, right? So try stump, so they do have some commonality, right? But the reality is, while it would be very common to find Queen W50 in a 430 cubic inch all aluminum light model, uh, both, both very high compression gasoline engines, right? You won't find it in one of these. If you go to any NASCAR race, you won't find 2050. I haven't been 2050 running a cup car in 15 years, probably. All right? Why? All right? What's the difference? You know, and it's not durability because these guys only have eight engines for the entire season. All their testing, all their racing, eight engines the entire season. Is that what Formula One rules are? Mm -hmm. In NASCAR, we actually run a zero W20 in our nationwide engines and truck series engines that by NASCAR rule have to run two races. So you get the track, you go through tech, they actually seal the engine and you have to bring that engine back. We are putting 1,200 miles, 1,200 race miles on the short block assembly on those engines before we rebuild them because they literally don't wear out. There's no reason, and when you're, you know, we'll get into it in a minute, but you know, those engines are being leased and there's a competitive market, so they're trying to drive the price down, so you're trying to get the maximum life out of those parts because you're talking about a ten thousand dollar crankshaft right so you don't want to take any chances with it but you also have to be competitive but it has to live a long time and provide a value for the guy that's leasing the motor for twenty thousand dollars a race right and that may sound like a lot but in reality it's not for what that engine is so again that, i just want to kind of frame the, the whole discussion around why because there's actually a good reason why 2050 became the most popular oil out there. But there's also a good reason why it's not always the best choice. Right? There's what works, and then there's actually what's better. They're not always the same thing. Right? So that's what I want to get into. And so, again, that's kind of the answer to that question myself just then. Real quick background so you know who I am and what all this comes from. Uh, I am Lake Speed Jr. Most of you guys who race probably know who my dad is, or was, right? That's still a lot, by the way. Um, Lake Speed Sr. is a NASCAR driver for 20 years. He's the only American to ever win the World Go-Karting Championship. Um, he beat some guy named Eric Senna in 1978. They said he was a pretty good driver, <laughs> you know? Um, so and we've actually come full circle. Me and my dad actually do vintage go-kart racing. That's Quincy, Illinois. Um, back last September, so we go out there and play around with these little two-stroke air-cooled uh, engines and run on straight methanol, which are an absolute blast. It's about 40 horsepower per engine, and that's a single engine version. We've got twin engine ones, and that's kicking the pants right there. You, know, you imagine a 300-pound go-kart with 80 horsepower. That's big time. Um, so, yeah, I come out of the racing background. I've grown up in the shop. You know, we, when Dad raced, most of the years we, he drove, we actually owned our own team, built our own engines, built our own cars. I mean, I've got cuts on my arm and scars from stamped sheet metal from GM when we were building those bills. Because that's how you used to build race cars, you know, in, in, in Cup. Um, 
since then, we've gone on, went to college. Um, I'm one of less than 200 people in the whole world that's a certified lubrication specialist and oil monitoring analyst. If you guys ever, you know, probably are all familiar with SAE and what they do for the automotive engineering, STLE is kind of like the, the oil um, lubricant engineers version of SAE. They actually do work together um, in, in some areas. Within STLE, they have a certified lubrication specialist, which basically you got to have a four-year degree uh, in science or some kind of engineering. You got to be in the industry for five years. You got to take all these classes. You got to pass all these tests and all this. And there's only about 900 people in the whole world who are actually CLS certified. Uh, and then the oil monitoring analyst is really cool. You guys ever watch that show CSI? Right? Okay. Oil analysis is kind of like playing CSI with used oil. It's trying to figure out what's going on in the engine. Right? Because you can, act, by analyzing the oil, you can actually see what's going on inside the engine and tell what parts are where. Right? I mean, a perfect example is if I get an oil sample back and I've got a lot of aluminum and a lot of iron and a lot of, a, a lot of silicon, Guess what? You need to replace your air cleaner. You need to check your intake track because that silicon is actually dirt. And it's getting through the intake track and it's getting in between your piston and the cylinder wall, which is where the aluminum and the iron come from. The trick is that that aluminum, as it wears, it oxidizes and becomes aluminum oxide, which is a cutting tool. And if you don't change your oil often enough and don't solve the problem, pretty soon you're going to have copper tin and lead in the oil from your bearings. So you can actually see all these things. You can, it's, it's actually really fun. It's like the coolest part of my job, actually. I, I love doing oil analysis. And one thing that's really cool, it's really not even that hard or that expensive to do. I mean, you can literally go down the street to the Caterpillar dealership back there on West and buy the oil analysis kit for 15 bucks. You can send it off and they get a lab report. And nine times out of 10, the dude in the lab has no idea how to analyze a racing fluid and he'll freak out because they're used to looking at hydraulic fluids and stuff and a racing fluid in a dirt car is going to be like you know an apocalypse to that guy he's going to say everything's wrong is dying stop what you're doing don't go again that's fine just send it to me i can tell you if you're okay or not because there's this different standard of reference you know and that's one of the thing you can do is i give I, I give you my email address you can email it to me i got a lot of guys that do it and I'll look at it and say, yeah, you're good, you're not. Look at, out for this, check that. It's one of the things we do and it's pretty cool. Traditional stuff does work. But is it really the best way to go with what's available today? You, you think about the... Oh, let's go to the first slide, right? So, doing a flat tappet valve train. Obviously, break-in is the most important part, right? Most critical time. So, with the Spintron, you can basically break in just the valve train by itself, right? One cool thing is you can then do it, do it, pull an oil sample from the break-in and look at what's going on inside the oil, right? So, broke in the exact same part number. Again, you know, measure the surface roughness, hardness of all the parts before you put it together. So there's no no difference in the parts. There's three identical sets of parts. Break in the first one using a high zinc, high detergent 1550, which is traditional what race oils are anymore. Because um, pretty much everybody's figured out the zinc thing by now. Break it in, breaks in just fine. There's no issue with it, right? It does not fail. Everything's good, All right? Take that out, put in the next one. Break it in with high zinc, low detergent, 1550. All right? Again, breaks in just fine. Everything's good. And then took the third one in and broke it in with a high zinc, low detergent, 5W30. All right? So the only difference between this one and that one is viscosity. The difference between here and there is just the detergent level. All right? Think about this. You know, zinc is trying to create a film to protect the parts. Detergents are, sound like just what they sound like. They clean. So they actually compete against the zinc. Think about every old school engine builder you ever knew. What did he say he used to break in a motor? Straight 30 weight, non-detergent. Right? It had nothing to be doing with being straight 30 weight. It was the non-detergent part. Because the old oils had more zinc in them, 
with no detergent, the zinc was free to do his job, and that's what that's how it worked, right? So it's the deter zinc detergent balance that's actually the most critical thing when it comes to break-in performance. That's even anaerobic performance overall. So all three cams broke in just fine, no no wear issues. When you do oil analysis and you look, you got 21 parts per million iron um, in this one, the high zinc, high detergent only 11 parts per million high zinc, low detergent. Just changing that balance, I cut my wear metals almost in half. Right? Changing viscosity, going to a lower viscosity grade, cut it yet in half again. So now I'm a third of my, of my wear metals. Right? Now that seems counterintuitive, right? I went to a thinner oil and I got more protection. That doesn't seem right, does it? Well, but you got to remember, it, and even the copper, right? So it's not just iron that it did. Across the board, in terms of wear metals, going to changing the balance and then going to a lower viscosity oil, I actually reduced the amount of wear, right? And what it comes down to is proper lubrication is the right oil, right? the right chemical balance, in the right place at the right time, right amount. On this morning when it was cold, if you had 2050 in your Chevy Cruze, how well do you think that engine would start or would it have even started? Yeah, it wouldn't have started very well, right? And your, but your oil pressure would have been way over here. Your oil pressure gauge would look stellar, right? But there wouldn't have been very much oil flow, right? And that's the difference, why you saw the reduction in wear metals, right? The high zinc, low detergent oil is the right chemical balance, but the 5W30 was able to get to the cam faster with more of it. Right, if you think about it, if you take on a cold morning and you pour a 2050 and a 530 and you pour it down an incline, which one's going to get to the bottom faster? 530. Right? You think about every cold night you go to the racetrack, early spring, late fall, and you go fire that motor up, which oil is going to get your camshaft faster? 2050 or 1040? 1040 is going to beat the 2050 every time. 70% of wear that occurs in a motor occurs at startup. It's not when it's running, it's the getting the oil there. And it can be as sticky and clingy and all you want to and, and all this, doesn't matter. You get that volume of oil. So that's always the way to look at your engine. You know, take all the brands and stuff, put that out the window, it doesn't matter. You want to look this way first, right? Once you've gone through this rationale in your head, then pick a brand that delivers all of this. Don't ever start with a brand first. The backwards way of doing. People ask me, "Well, what oil well, should I run for my passenger car?" So, real simple: get your owner's manual, flip it open, find what spec it oil calls for, find what viscosity it calls for, then pick a brand you trust to deliver those two. As long as the engine's stock and you haven't made any changes, that's how you do it. Don't try to pick a brand and whatever their best chemistry is and try to out it. No, no, don't. Right oil, right place, right time, right amount. Always think of that first. Because what that does is inside your engine, well, this, this thing is called a stride back curve. And basically, this, it will show you, it shows you what happens where inside your engine. Right? Because your bearings are being lubricated in a different way than the valve train is. Right? There's three stages of lubrication. Everybody here been water skiing or at least seen people water ski? Okay? I've got an 11-year-old son. My dad, you know, grew group Mississippi, loved to go water skiing and all that kind of stuff for lake rats. i got an 11-year-old son, weighs about 65 pounds. If I put him on two skis, how fast does the boat need to be going to pull that little bitty dude up on those two big skis? Not very fast. I can probably almost pull the rope and get him up, right? 
Now, if I get out there, and I weigh about 165, and I get on a slalom ski, on one ski, how much faster does the boat have to go to pick me up? Yeah. That's all you have to understand to understand lubrication. Like when there's zero speed, when the boat's not going, what do both me and my son have in common? We're both wet. <laughs> right? Because we're, we're sunk down the lake. Right? So, and that's what this curve is. I mean, it looks all crazy and like, I don't understand it. But all that is is viscosity times speed divided by load. Right? Go back to the, th the water skiing analogy. The viscosity is the water, right? Which is a very low viscosity fluid, but it's constant the whole time. It doesn't change in our equation. All we're changing is the speed required to get up out of the water for the weight of the skier, the load. Right, so that's your speed load equation, right? Y'all follow that? So high speed, light load, we're in this hydrodynamic stage, right? And that's what your bearings are. When you're, once the engine's up and running, it's the, the oil film. And that's all based on speed and load. The higher the speed, the less viscosity you need, or the higher the load you can carry. So faster speeds can make it build a thicker film, you know, for the same viscosity. So that's what happens over here. Now, we'll flip back over here. Your valve train is your boundary condition. That's your low speed, high load. And the reality is, um, you ever seen the guy with the bearing tester? You seen all that kind of stuff? The, the ridiculous part of the bearing tester is, oh, they're saying, oh, this oil, you know, it's got this film strength. Well, film strength's not even a word that's even used in either STLE, SAE, you know, or, or anything in lubrication engineering. It's a false term. Because there's three stages of lubrication. And all oils, all machines will experience some function of them at some point in time. Right? The loads that you could apply with that bearing tester are still lower than what happens in your valve train. When you have on the closing ramp of a cam at about 6,000 RPM, when that valve closes and that push rod finally unloads, all that energy that's transferred back, right, because you had to you load it to try to open the valve, right? So your whole valve train is kind of getting squished, which is why that real thin push rod that's really light is not very good because all it becomes is a pole vault. It bends and holds energy. And then once the valves actually open, it releases all that energy and shoves the valve deeper in the head, which takes all the slack out of the valve train. But when that valve spring comes back, it hits it, causes it to load back up, and then it punches your cam load. So it takes a lifter and it shoves it. That pressure spike, you know, I can go get a thing from comp and you can watch it. You know, the opening and closing event. On the seat down here, you'll have this big spike. 40,000 PSI. Instantaneous spike. Right? So that whole cam profile, as that valve, you know, or the lifter follows the cam, it's in the boundary condition the whole time. The loads are so high, especially the flat tappet, because the flat tappet is rotating and sliding as it goes over the cam lobe. It's wiping all the oil away. So there is no oil film in the valve train. That's where it comes down to your additive package. Right, that's back to your zinc versus detergent balance. So if you have the right additive package, that's what protects you here. Right? And your high, high load, low speed condition. Because think about it, your valve train runs at what percent of crankshaft speed? Half. All right, so I have half the speed, but then I have static load from my valve springs. And the higher the RPM of the motor, the higher my valve spring pressures. So a high RPM motor spends more time in the boundary condition than a low RPM engine does. So the higher the RPM, the more critical your additive package becomes because of these, right? So this is your, you know, valve train, and that's all about additives, right? Your bearings are all about base oil. 
then your pistons have a very interesting life. Because what does a piston have to do twice each stroke? Stop. It's got to stop and change directions. <laughs> you know? So, when you think about a piston nearing top dead center on a compression stroke, I have increasing cylinder pressure driving the rings into the cylinder wall while I have decreasing speed. All right? My, my water ski, you're going in the no wake zone. All right? You think about it, where is most of the wear in the cylinder? Ring reversal. Mostly on the top because of that building cylinder pressure. So you, there, both additives and base oil make a difference. Right? How good does my base oil support this film condition as I move towards here? Your, your valve train, I mean, sorry, your, your pistons, you can actually reduce the cylinder bore wear by having the right kind of additive package along with the right base oils for that. So that's what's happening in your engine. So understanding those different things will help you see, okay, what's going on where and how I need to choose the right. So the question becomes, well, how thick does the oil really need to be? All right? And the answer to that is actually, it varies. All right? There's no direct answer. One of the main reasons why we can run 0W20 in a NASCAR engine is because we've gone to super finishing. All right? If you think about it, um, let's go back two slides. This surface roughness. The rougher that surface is, the thicker the base wall has to be to get to this point, right? If I go to smoother surfaces, I can actually run thinner oil and still keep those surfaces apart. I'm still in that full film mode with a, with a lighter oil. And that's one of the main reasons why the guys have gone to this. So just, you know, tumbling, polishing, and that's one of the main reasons we go back. Hey, why did 2050 become important? In the old days, when we didn't have as good machining equipment, the tolerances were, were looser, the surfaces were rougher, we had to have thicker oil. But with, when today, when you have CNC machines and you've got you know, high-speed grinders that are using more advanced coolants, you can, you're getting finished parts that actually have much better surface finishes. You know, they're smoother. So you can do that. And now we're also getting into all kinds of coatings. Right? Because the coatings go one step further. Right? Not only do I have a smooth surface, now I have coatings that actually not only improve surface integrity, also lo have lower friction. I can get by with more as I smooth those surfaces. And the other thing people have done is they've also started paying attention to surface area. Right? Not only do you have polished cranks and all this, and you sometimes coated bearings, all of which is helping you to be able to run lighter oil, you also start going to smaller journals. And that's why the guys, you know, in NASCAR run, you know, the Honda rod bearings and the two-inch mains. You do that to bring the size down, to slow down the speed, so that I'm not building extra heat. Because all it is at some point, higher speeds are just generating more heat, right? So reducing surface area, smoothing things down, striking that right balance gives you a path for reducing friction, which allows me to run higher speed engines with lighter oils without having any problems and, and getting better durability longer performance um, from the engine. There's a cross-section of what a cup piston was five years ago. Right? And you look at how small that skirt is. You know, you know 0 0.7, 0 0.7 millimeter first and second rings, 2 mil oil control ring. You know, so you get those really light ring packages so you can run, you know, higher RPMs. And the skirt sizes get smaller, piston gets lighter and live at higher RPM without coming apart. So those are the ideas, um, reducing it down. And the next thing is oil clearances, right? So in the old days when you had rougher parts and the parts weren't as strong, they would bend more, 
you had to run looser clearances. The looser the clearance, the thicker the oil you have to have to fill the gap. If I have loose clearance and I put in a light oil, all the oil bleeds out. All right, remember the oil is being fed in from up here. If that's a main, jur main journal, oil is being fed in from up here, but the load is being carried down there. All right, so that's one of the false theories of high oil pressure. If you run too high oil pressure, you're actually pushing the crank down. <laughs> that's actually counterintuitive what you want, all right? Because down here is what actually supports the load. You need to have enough pressure to make sure you're supplying the oil, but it's the rotation of the journal that drags the oil in here and creates that film, right? If I have too light of an oil, what happens is it bleeds off up here and never makes it down there. And what happens is typically in the main is you fry the rod bearings first because you don't have enough, all it bleeds out, the main ends up being its own oil pump it supports itself, but there's not enough oil to then feed the rod bearings, and the rod bearings burn out. But the mains still look okay. Right? That's because you had too low a viscosity for your clearance. If I tighten my clearance up, I can go to lower viscosity. And that was what most people's problem was, and why low viscosity oil's got a bad rap, is when people first tried to do what they heard the NASCAR guys were doing, or the drag race guys were doing, run low viscosity oils, what they failed to do was adjust their clearances for it. They went from a 2050 down to a 1030 and they lost oil pressure, fried the rod bearings and said, well that oil sucks. Well, it really wasn't the oil's fault, it was not the right fit for the application. Because <clears throat> you got to tighten up the clearances to make that work, to make sure you had the right oil in the right place, the right time, the right amount. All right? Hopefully that makes sense. So the, kind of the rule of thumb is, Smooth surfaces, tighter clearances, thinner oil. Works great. It's actually a great combination. But if I have rougher surfaces and looser clearances, you have to run thicker oil. That's the way it goes. There it goes again. It's not happy with us. And when we talk about oil viscosity, I don't know what that is. I don't know either. Um, the best way to think about viscosity is it's kind of a fancy word for resistance to flow. And the best way to, to think about viscosity is thinking about maple syrup, right? And you're thinking, what the hell are you talking about, right? If you're thinking about maple syrup, and you take it and you pour it, take it out of the refrigerator, and it's cold, and you go pour it in your pancakes. How does it how does it flow? Not too good. It's thick. Is that hot pancake? What does it do? Thins out. All oils get thinner as they get hotter. All of them no matter what they do. So really when it comes to viscosity, what's most important is temperature, right? If you look at a 15W50 versus a 520 versus a 0W5, and you look at 100 degrees, 212, and 300, you'll find that all three of those oils will out actually be the same viscosity, just at different temperatures. All right, so when you hear the drag race guys, oh, they run 0W5 in the Pro Stock motors. Yes, they did. The oil temperature never gets over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It might get to 105 in the middle of the summer when it's really hot. Because they chill the water, they don't heat the oil, they push the car to the line, they start it up, they do a burnout, 6.7 seconds later, it's over with and done. So the oil starts out at about 60 degrees Fahrenheit and gets as hot as 100, and that's it. So at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, at 0W5 is the same viscosity as a 5W20 is at 200 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the same viscosity as a 1550 at 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Right? So the reason why the Outlaw Sprint Car guys run 1550 is because they run 8 quarts of oil, no oil cooler, at the end of a, lap, a 50 lap A main, that's how hot the oil is. So they're running a really thick viscosity oil to offset the temperature effect. If they were willing to put an oil cooler on the car in a larger volume of oil, they could run a lot lower viscosity oil and they wouldn't need to have it. Because all they need is this much viscosity, 10 centistokes. Because that's true viscosity, not SAA grades. Because SAA grades are only measured at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But not every race engine runs at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So that's where understanding what your oil temperature is makes a difference, which again goes back to why 2050? In the old days, when you had a wet sump motor, no oil cooler, spin on oil filter, right next to the stock header, how hot do you think that oil was? Way over here. So you're running that thicker oil to make up for it. But if you're running, you know, a wet sump or a dry sump motor, or at least a wet sump motor with a good pan, with a remote oil cooler, or at least a remote oil filter to get it away from the header, your oil temperature can come way down and you don't need as thick oil. Again, go back to our cam break in thing we saw. Which one of these oils gets to the bearing first when you fire the motor up? <laughs> this one does 0.5. Of course, that's way too light to race on, but if you can hold your oil temperature to 220, then the 520 actually works better. You got to qualify, and the engine's not very warm. Which one's going to make more power? <laughs> right? So that's where understanding the temperature effect of viscosity is really important. Uh, one of the cool things about, say, a conventional or, say, a synthetic oil versus a conventional is this idea called viscosity index. Because not all oils thin out at the same rate. Some oils get thinner faster than others. So here's a conventional 320 and a conventional 220. These are both hydraulic fluids, right? So the 220 is lighter than the 320, but the rate of change is the same because the viscosity index is the same. When you go, which is about 100. When you go to a synthetic 220, right? Same viscosity as this because they measure uh, hydraulic fluids at 40 degrees C. This is all in Celsius, um, which has about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. You go to higher viscosity index, say 150 with this, this oil flows better colder and doesn't thin out as much as it gets hotter. So it's, it's known in industrial settings, if you go from a conventional gearbox oil to a synthetic gearbox oil, you drop down one viscosity grade, right? Because the synthetic 220 is actually the same viscosity as the conventional 320 at high temperature. All right, so if you're running a conventional 20W50 and you put in a synthetic 15W50, you actually put in a thicker oil, which is going to have more drag and create more heat. And heat is the enemy of your engine. Right? You got to reject that heat and get it out of the engine. So actually going to a synthetic 1040 is actually keeping you at the same place. Right? So that, that's way, one way of looking at it. Other way kind of visualizing it is, you know, again, rough surface inside your engine, there's your bearings. A 30 gray with a low viscosity index of 100, 6,000 RPM, 400 horsepower. At low temperature, I've got an oil film. I'm good. Temperature goes up, oil film collapses. Now what do I do? I can go to a higher viscosity grade, which is going to be worse on startup flow, but we'll get my oil film back, or I can increase my viscosity index. Get the same viscosity grade, higher viscosity index, same power, same load, same speed, same high temperature, I have my oil film back in this back. That's obviously more efficient, right, than a low viscosity index oil, but even a higher viscosity grade. So what people typically do, and while they have, you know, 5W30s, even over here, your passenger car grades, what the idea is, is you want that oil to flow good at startup, maintain that film thickness. They do that using viscosity modifiers, polymers that expand as the oil gets hotter. They start off small when it's cold, they get bigger as they get hotter. The only problem is these things are actually made from the same material rubber band's made out of. So at really high RPM, high loads, high shear loads, that you'll see, especially a stroker motor, high RPM motor, what happens when you stretch a rubber band? Well, before it snaps, it gets thinner. The section you pull thins out. The Scotty modifier is shear, and you lose some of that lifting effect. So, which is why, again, people in the old days, 
add my 2050 race oil. Well, I tried a low viscosity oil, but they tried low viscosity oil. They bought it like AutoZone or Walmart, which is a passenger car oil, which is jack full of viscosity modifier. And they can look at a spec sheet and say, well, this is this viscosity index, and that stuff was, you know, 50 points higher than my race oil. The problem is it was it was higher because of viscosity modifier. It wasn't inherent in the oil. And that's the difference. You know, when you go to a real synthetic, and that's where this new MPA, this is a really new technology, it's only about two years old. Um, your viscosity index of conventional petroleum oil is 100. That's what this Pennsylvania crude standard reference. Your synthetics like Mobile Ones and AMS oil and all that kind of stuff has been around for a long time. 150. This stuff's been out in the market for about 40 years. And it was definitely better. Right? Your MPAO is brand new stuff. Viscosity index is almost 200. So it's a complete game changer. And what it lets you do is I can create a, say, a 5W30 that has a higher bearing oil film thickness than my passenger car was. Talk about that polymer stretching and breaking. That's what you see here. That drop is the polymer stretching and breaking. Right? Obviously, a conventional oil, to have a higher viscosity index, is going to require more viscosity modifier, more parts that can break, right, compared to a synthetic which have, will have less. But when you do it with an MPAO, the higher the film thickness, because you're not using viscosity modifiers, it doesn't break, plus the MPAO is really thick, it promotes that film thickness, because this is what your bearing film thickness is at 300 degrees. So it lets you build a thicker oil that maintains its thickness under high temperature, high shear, but still a 5W30, right? So this would actually be the same equipped 3.5 is what a diesel engines require. That's how they can do it. But without this kind of technology, you couldn't have done it, right? So. When you're trying to get lighter and lighter oil to make more power using the MPAOs, we've been able to gain power from the previous oil that didn't have MPAO just by swapping around base oils. Make the same HTHS make more power, right? And what, what all it comes down to is this, right? Going back, smooth surfaces, tighter clearances. I can run thinner oil. The MPAO lets us control how thin it goes because the oil is not varying as much, right? I can push closer to the bottom without worrying about falling off the edge. So I can extract more power. If I've got rougher surfaces, looser clearances, I still have to have thicker oil, right? But if I can run a high viscosity index synthetic, that's actually better than a low viscosity index petroleum. Right? So there's a gain that can be had thinking it that way. And then it gets down to the you know, brass tacks. All this stuff sounds really cool. Okay, at the end of the day, you know, my sponsor is my, my wallet. <laughs> right? You know, not everybody is fortunate to have a Home Depot, a FedEx, and M&Ms. They're going to give you $20 million a year. Right? NASCAR's La La Land. It's, it's a false reality. You know, because everybody, somebody's, somebody else pays for everything, right? It's TV world. So, what's the math on this, really? Well, you take your standard petroleum race, and it'll cost about five bucks a quart. If you're changing it every hundred laps, it's costing you about five cents a lap, right? If you're running a synthetic oil, it's about sixteen bucks a quart, but it can last for five hundred laps, and it can. Every hundred laps, is change oil filter and add oil. Right? Only cost you three cents a lap. Again, yeah, we race this stuff 500 miles every Sunday. I've got tons of guys doing this exact same program. Every 100 laps, change the filter, add oil. You work out the math, it works out cheaper. It will be about three cents a lap as opposed to five cents a lap. 
The biggie is, if you're running a limited class where you have to run snap steel rocker arms, most guys are having to put what on the left hand side of the motor every so often? New rockers, right? Because the thick oil doesn't flow as well, you get less cooling, these get hot, you got to replace them. Eight, seven bucks a set. I got guys who used to have to replace rocker arms twice a year. Now they don't. Same rocker arms all year. Never change them. Really dumb question. Why on the left hand side of the motor? Because you're turning right, or you're turning left, right? Oh, Keep on right. turning left, all the oil goes to the right. Okay. Maybe, it, it, and the same thing on springs. Like a 305 sprint car, a 360 sprint car, same thing happens all the time. These are the ones you're replacing, and the ones that go weak, front side, left hand back. And again, just cheap, you just stock replacement parts, and not high end stuff, 92 bucks for a set of springs. If you go buy a set of PSI springs, you're talking about a thousand bucks for a set. So, just what you save on parts alone, if this math was the same, you were way ahead just on part savings alone. That's where the real value of the better quality oil comes in. It's what it does in saving you parts. That's the real value in all this stuff.